Every day, millions of Americans get stuck in traffic or squeezed into crowded airport gates waiting for delayed flights. But halfway around the world, there's a country where high-speed travel isn't just fast, it's almost perfect. In Japan, bullet trains carry over 400,000 passengers a day, traveling at speeds of more than 200 miles per hour, without a single passenger death in nearly 60 years of operation. So how did Japan build one of the safest, most punctual transportation systems in the world? And more importantly, why doesn't the United States have anything like it? To answer that, we need to go back to the early 1960s. Japan was preparing to host the 1964 Tokyo Olympics, its first time on the world stage since World War II. The country wanted to showcase not just its recovery, but its future. At the time, Japan's main cities were already connected by rail. But those trains were slow, averaging around 50 miles per hour. And the network was struggling to keep up with post-war economic growth. Engineers proposed a radical idea, a dedicated high-speed passenger line connecting Tokyo and Osaka. No freight, no slow sections, just pure, uninterrupted speed. The government approved it, and construction began on what would become the world's first high-speed rail line, the Shinkansen, or New Trunk Line. When the first Shinkansen debuted in October 1964, it stunned the world. Trains could hit 130 miles per hour, unheard of at the time, and cut travel time between Tokyo and Osaka from six and a half hours to just four. Within a few years, that time dropped again to under three hours. The benefits were immediate, Businesses could connect faster, tourism boomed, and Japan's domestic air routes faced serious competition. But perhaps the most remarkable part wasn't the speed, it was the safety. From day one, the Shinkansen was built around one guiding principle, eliminate every possible risk. Tracks are entirely separated from roadways, no level crossings, no chance of a car or pedestrian wandering into the path of a train. The trains themselves use an advanced signaling system that automatically slows or stops them if anything is wrong, long before a human operator could react. And the infrastructure is obsessively maintained. Tracks are inspected multiple times a day. After earthquakes, sensors automatically halt all trains. And in 60 years of operation, there has never been a passenger fatality due to derailment or collision. Now compare that to the United States. Passenger trains here usually run on freight-owned tracks where freight trains get priority. Many lines are decades old with outdated signaling and curves designed for 19th century steam engines, not modern high-speed trains. When Amtrak launched its high-speed Acela service in 2000, it averaged just 68 miles per hour between Boston and Washington, D.C., barely half the speed of the slowest Shinkansen line. Why? Because the Acela still shares track with slower trains, has to slow down for curves, and can't run at top speed for long stretches. And Acela's limitations aren't just technical, they're financial. Because it operates on old infrastructure, billions of dollars go into patching up tracks, replacing bridges, and upgrading signaling just to maintain reliability. Instead of a purpose-built high-speed corridor, America is trying to fit a 21st century train onto a 19th century skeleton. It's like putting a Formula One car on a dirt road. The vehicle itself might be cutting edge, but the environment around it guarantees mediocrity. The problem is compounded by ownership. In Japan, the Shinkansen lines are dedicated to passenger trains only. In the United States, 97% of Amtrak routes run on tracks owned by freight rail companies. Federal law technically gives passenger trains priority, but in practice, freight delays are common. When a 10,000-foot-long freight train crawls through the system, Amtrak trains sit and wait. That's why even the so-called high-speed services are forced to crawl. And this isn't just an East Coast problem. High-speed proposals have popped up across the country, in Florida, Texas, California, and the Midwest. But most have collapsed under political pressure, lawsuits, or funding cuts. Florida's original bullet train plan, approved by voters in 2000, was canceled just four years later after a change in state leadership. California's project has been scaled back, delayed, and mocked as a train to nowhere. Each failure reinforces the perception that America simply can't do high-speed rail, even though the underlying issue is a lack of commitment, not a lack of capability. 
If you've ever ridden a bullet train in Japan, you know another thing that stands out there on time. Almost impossibly so. The average delay on the Shinkansen is measured in seconds, not minutes. In 2017, one train company even issued a public apology because a train left the station 20 seconds early. This obsession with punctuality comes from a mix of culture and design. The system is built so that trains can run with precision, dedicated tracks, consistent speeds, and careful scheduling so nothing gets in the way. In the US, shared tracks and unpredictable freight schedules make this kind of reliability nearly impossible. Critics often say high-speed rail is too expensive for the US, but Japan's example shows the opposite can be true in the long run. The original Tokaido Shinkansen line cost about $3.6 billion in today's money to build, and paid for itself in just seven years through ticket sales. Since then, the network has expanded to over 1,900 miles of track, serving almost every major region of the country. But the economics go beyond ticket sales. The Shinkansen fundamentally reshaped how Japanese cities do business. Real estate near bullet train stations skyrocketed in value, attracting new offices, hotels, and retail developments. Entire industries reorganized around the train's reach, with companies setting up headquarters in Osaka knowing they could be in Tokyo for a morning meeting and back by dinner. It also changed domestic aviation. Before the Shinkansen, airlines dominated travel between Tokyo and Osaka. But within a decade of the train's launch, air passenger numbers on that route collapsed by nearly 80%. Planes simply couldn't compete with the convenience of boarding a train in the city center, skipping airport security lines, and arriving downtown just a couple hours later. Instead of killing airlines, the shift forced them to specialize in longer-haul international routes, making the entire transportation system more efficient. And perhaps the most overlooked economic benefit is reliability. In Japan, a late arrival can mean lost contracts, delayed shipments, or thousands of wasted working hours. By keeping average delays under a single minute, the Shinkansen doesn't just save time, it generates billions in productivity gains every year. That hidden value rarely shows up in ticket revenue, but it's one of the biggest reasons businesses and governments continue to invest in high-speed rail. Meanwhile, in the US, highways and airports require constant taxpayer subsidies, and traffic congestion costs the economy an estimated $100 billion a year in lost productivity. From that perspective, the Shinkansen wasn't just affordable, it was a bargain. The bullet train isn't just a fast train, it's a rolling piece of precision engineering. The latest models like the N700S use active suspension to tilt into curves, keeping the ride smooth at high speeds. They have aerodynamic noses to reduce tunnel boom, the loud shock wave that happens when entering tunnels at speed. Power comes from distributed traction. Instead of one big engine pulling from the front, motors are spread across multiple cars. This gives better acceleration, braking, and redundancy. If one motor fails, the train can still run safely. While the Shinkansen's record is remarkable, it's not flawless. In 2004, a powerful earthquake caused a derailment. But thanks to reinforced design and automatic braking, there were no injuries. In 2015, a passenger attempted self-immolation on board, leading to changes in security screening. Each incident has been met with rapid safety upgrades, showing that perfect is not the goal. Constant improvement is. High-speed rail isn't just fast and safe, it's green. Per passenger, the Shinkansen emits about 1 8 the CO2 of a domestic flight and 1 12 that of a car trip. Japan's dense population and integrated transit system make this even more impactful. You can step off a bullet train and onto a local subway within minutes. No parking lots or taxi rides needed. In the US, long car commutes and short haul flights are some of the biggest contributors to transportation emissions. So why hasn't America caught up? The reasons are a mix of politics, geography, and priorities. Building new rail lines requires buying land and in the US, property rights make that slow and expensive. Powerful airline and highway lobbies have fought against high-speed rail projects for decades. And without the same population density as Japan's coastal cities, it's harder to guarantee profitability, at least in the short term. But the deeper reason lies in America's transportation philosophy. After World War II, the US doubled down on cars and planes. President Eisenhower's interstate highway program poured billions into roads, while airlines enjoyed subsidies, tax breaks, and federally funded airports. Railroads, on the other hand, were left to decline. 
By the time Amtrak was created in 1971, it was essentially a bailout for a dying industry, not an investment in a new one. There's also a cultural hurdle. In Japan and Europe, trains are seen as a modern, respectable way to travel. In America, trains carry a stigma of being outdated or only for those who can't afford to fly. That perception makes it politically difficult to win broad support, even in regions where a bullet train could clearly succeed. And then there's lobbying power. Highway contractors, oil companies, and airlines all have a vested interest in keeping the status quo. For decades, they've funneled money into campaigns and lobbying groups that oppose high-speed rail. The result is a vicious cycle. Without investment, U.S. rail lags behind, which reinforces the belief that trains can't compete, which then justifies even less investment. Finally, America's geography is often cited as an excuse. Yes, the country is larger and more spread out than Japan, but that argument falls apart when you look at the Northeast Corridor in Boston, New York, Philadelphia, Washington, D.C. A region with 50 million people packed into a space smaller than Japan. If high-speed rail can thrive in France, Spain, or China, it could certainly work here. The problem isn't geography, it's priorities. That said, change is starting. Projects like California's high-speed rail and Texas Central's Dallas to Houston line, aimed to bring Shinkansen-level service to the U.S. Brightline in Florida, is showing that faster, more reliable trains can attract riders, even if they're not yet true bullet trains. The lesson from Japan isn't just build faster trains, it's about designing transportation as a system, one that values safety, punctuality, and user experience as much as speed. It means separating passenger lines from freight, investing in modern signaling, and making rail competitive with air travel in time, cost, and convenience. In 1964, Japan bet big on a radical new idea, and it paid off for generations. The U.S. could make the same bet today. The question is, will we? Or will we keep choosing traffic jams, crowded airports, and missed opportunities? Because the thing about the bullet train isn't just that it's fast. It's that it shows what's possible when a country decides that getting somewhere safely and on time isn't a luxury, it's a promise.